So yeah, we're a year into the pandemic, pandemic, and uh, one of the things I miss most about the broader society is the arts. Going to concerts, going to shows, going to any kind of live performances was something we all took for granted before the lockdown. And just like the rest of the economy, the arts and culture industry has taken a devastating hit this past year. And the burden of this crisis has of course fallen on the performing artists themselves and all the people who do the work behind the scenes to make live art possible. The broader arts and culture sector, including Hollywood, is an $878 billion industry. This sector supports 5 million wage and salary jobs, including makeup artists, stage hands, ushers, camera operators, and the list goes on. Most performing artists are not millionaire movie stars or pop singers. The median annual salary for full-time musicians and singers was $43,000. It was around $41,000 for actors and $36,000 for dancers and choreographers. Um, choreographers. These people rely on a consistent stream of gigs to get by, and the disruption to their economic lives during the pandemic has been astounding. According to a recent New York Times article, um, during the quarter ending in September, when the overall unemployment rate averaged 8.5 percent, 52 percent of actors, 55 percent of dancers, and 27 percent of musicians were out of work, according to the National Endowment for the Arts. My fear is we're not just losing jobs, we're losing careers, said Adam Crothammer, president of Local 802 of the American Federation of Musicians in New York. He said 95% of the local 7,000 members are not working on a regular basis because of the mandated shutdown. It will create a great cultural depression, he said. And this is nothing short of a crisis for the arts, but we can turn to some of the more inspirational aspects of the New Deal for guidance on how we approach this moment. When people hear Works Progress Administration, they usually think of government created jobs to build dams, create national parks and overhaul our infrastructure. But the WPA also uh, made other critical programs possible. Through the Federal Arts Project and the Federal Music Project, thousands of visual artists, sculptors, writers, actors, musicians, architects, and photographers were put to work with a living wage. These reproductions of the American scene of today will make this one of the most fertile periods of our country's art. Some of this work is done on canvas, but much of it is created on the walls of our schools, libraries, and other public buildings in the form of mural paintings. Of particular interest is the great mural in the mess hall of the Military Academy at West Point, depicting great warriors of history. An art long dormant in the United States is the creation of stained glass windows. One project devoted to this art has made a window for the Military Academy at West Point, depicting scenes from the life of Washington. Commemorative tablets like this are among the contributions of sculptors to the works program, and they also create works of art for our parks and public buildings. Many American museums have long been in need of highly skilled experts to restore valuable historical material, such as this Persian ceiling, which is forming under the deft fingers of a WPA artist in the Philadelphia Museum. So art and the artists that produced it were treated as something to be proud of, to treasure and to cultivate. During this brief period, art made its way out of the ivory towers, art galleries and cocktail parties and into public spaces to be enjoyed by as many working people as possible. The art historian Jody Patterson describes the artists of those years, saying they were given studio spaces, materials, a living wage, but also they had an audience. And that is really key. Art is part of a dialogue. You often have work sitting in a studio or in a gallery or hung above somebody's mantelpiece, but it doesn't have public reception. These artists had a built in expectation that they have an audience. They were going to be put out into public spaces. That was really important. Also, there was a sense of community. Artists were often meeting together, not just in some of the spaces that have been set up in terms of studios and collecting paychecks, but at union meetings. There was a social scene. Artists were, were removed from the isolation and alienation of the ivory tower, intermingling and interacting and having discussions. The sculptures, murals, and paintings were done at post offices, schools, hospitals, parks, and museums, where the public lived and worked, telling the stories of working people. The Federal Art Project also had a non-discrimination clause that drew in a significant number of black artists. 15% of all WPA employees were black and WPA propaganda even specifically highlighted this. 
Under the works program, musicians, artists, writers, and actors contribute their share to the cultural development of the community. The Negro Theater Unit of the Federal Theater Project produced a highly successful version of Shakespeare's immortal tragedy, Macbeth, which far exceeded its scheduled run in New York and was later sent on a tour of the country. The scene was changed from Scotland to Haiti, but the spirit of Macbeth and every line in the play has remained intact. In this contribution to the American theater and in other projects under the works program, we have set our feet on the road toward a brighter future. Black writers like Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright, and Zora Neale Hurston benefited from WPA art programs. Black painters like Jacob Lawrence and Alan Kreit were employed by the government to depict scenes from black cultural life not usually aired in the mainstream. During its four years of federal financing, the Federal Writers Project supported almost 7,000 writers, editors, and researchers. The Federal Music Project employed thousands of musicians, gave public performances to the work of unknown composers, and trained music therapists. And these programs existed within the network of universal programs that allowed more people to take advantage of them. For example, Title II of the GI Bill funded schooling for veterans at the institution of their choice. And this security allowed many people to explore their artistic talents to develop their full human potential instead of being forced to make the most pragmatic financial choice. If we could do this in the 1930s, there's no reason we can't recreate the spirit today. This should be our, our model as we face the crisis of the arts in the post-pandemic world, not a patchwork of nonprofits and foundations. And this is about more than putting money in the pockets of artists, though that is important. This is about valuing arts for art's sake, for valuing the development of every individual's full human potential instead of measuring them by the profits they can produce. When we cultivate art as a public good and not a diversion for elites, we cultivate a culture of unity and solidarity. If you want an example of just what a society can achieve when it invests in its people and its artists, look no further than Venezuela. In 1975, the program El Sistema was dreamed up. Soon with government backing, it became a universal program providing hours of music instruction built into the day of every child in Venezuela. Listen to the founder of El Sistema, Jose Abreu, talking about his vision. No child is excluded. Children with special needs or who are blind or deaf all experience the transformative power of music. The set of values that is introduced into the children is that they live in a community that cooperates with solidarity so that the orchestra becomes a school of social living. And the other value is that the community works and marches towards a common goal, a social goal and an individual goal. I think all music creativity is of value to all humankind, but classical music allows for a more elevated and rich set of values, more complex, more complete. Miles de niños, por lo menos, hablando musicalmente, miles de niños haciendo música. Miles de niños disfrutando el hecho de, de, de poder tocar un instrumento, de poder cantar. Y eso es posible aquí en Venezuela. Y por qué no en el mundo. The deep social impact this program has had is undeniable. Keeping youth occupied in a productive collective project and avoiding the most alienating features of their surroundings. Listen to what the participants themselves say about their experience.
era el primer día de la orquesta de cámara, entonces yo venía temprano y me dijeron, mmm, me dieron un disparo en la pierna y no pude ir. Y entonces yo llorando porque no me dolía, me dolía la pierna, pero más me dolía que no iba a estar aquí el día ese en la orquesta de cámara. Y se le olvida cuando uno llega aquí, se le olvida todo, todo, todo. El profesor nos dice, toquen pero con su corazón, no con, no con la mente, con el corazón. En Venezuela nosotros estamos en este momento trabajando para un universo de beneficiarios que se calcula en 265 mil jóvenes y niños, pero esto es apenas el comienzo. Nosotros estamos aprendiendo a tocar trompeta como para sacar nuestra familia adelante. Estamos para adelante como el elefante. La raíz para mí del problema social está en la exclusión. Entonces nosotros tenemos que luchar por incluir el mayor número, todos si es posible, incluirlos en este mundo bello, ¿verdad? Que es nuestro mundo de la música. So what happens when you seriously invest in music as a social right? What happens when kids from some of the poorest and most violent slums of Venezuela get this opportunity? Just watch. Just amazing. Wish we could play the whole clip. Art is increasingly becoming the domain of the privileged and elite. We need to change that. And just like so many other social problems we face, this can only truly be done by public universal programs with the full support of the federal government. Just like some people have a newfound appreciation for workers that deliver your food and your packages because of the pandemic, let us have a renewed appreciation for what artists do to make our society worth living in And let's fight for federal programs that reflect that. And, um, you know, Jen, there, El Sistema has become this global phenomenon. And there are a lot of attempts to do this um, in the United States now. But the problem is they are missing the fundamental point of it. They are trying to do it through nonprofits, mm. these very limited patchwork efforts. And, like, what makes El Sistema El Sistema is that it is a, um, it is a universal program. It has massive federal support or national mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. um, of the government. Um, so, and you know, it, it, interestingly enough, I mean, this started before Chavez, um, it's not even necessarily a byproduct of, of a leftist government there, but it's been supported throughout the years. Um, mm -hmm. so I think people who are trying to do that here on a limited nonprofit level are kind of missing, uh, the right. key ingredient. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the most important 
like point that you make is that it's not just about supporting the artists themselves, although of course we want to do that, um, but it's about uh, democratizing or at least broadening access to participation in the arts, um, which as you pointed out uh, just now is sort of rapidly closing in the US. And um, it's it's just so cool, like during the New Deal, like if you wanted to right. use some stained glass or <laughs> like spend a year like going around the country, like writing poems about fields or whatever, that you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. um, you know, it, it, of course, brings to mind the kind of classic or the famous Marx quote about, you know, when we fairly distribute uh, labor and resources, you know, if you want, you can you can fish in the morning and like herd cattle in the afternoon and criticize after dinner. And you can do all of that without becoming a fisherman or, right. a, you know, cattle driver or a critic. Um, and I think for me, one of the kind of most painful things about, you know, a uh, uh, trying to make it as like an artist or a writer or any kind of creative in the US is that there's such intense professionalization because mm -hmm. the path to success is so narrow. So it's like, if you wanna be a sculptor, like you have to go to Yale art school in order to have right. any kind of shot or, you know, you'll be working like a dead end job and trying to sculpt on your free time. And it's just, it's, it's a mess, so. Right. Yeah. And I think, I mean, people want this. I mean, talk to anyone right now, whether they're working class, middle class, leftist, not a leftist, not political. I mean, you'll hear so many people say like, man, I miss concerts, you know, like <laughs> art is a thing, you know, even if people don't think of themselves as like a highbrow artist, like art mm -hmm. is something everyone loves and needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly.